and of course to Morris as well. So when the now Internet of Things meets the uh, blockchain. So please. Yeah. Just to make sure before we start, can you hear me in the back? Oh. Nah. Nah? No. <laughs> okay, Krista. Okay, so we'll be switching then the microphones when we need to. Uh, so, again, I'm Maria Besuki, I'm QA at Ignite, and this is uh, Marish Koto, Java developer at Ignite, and today we'll be telling you about Internet of Things and uh, how we're going to monetize them. So we'd like to turn your attention to generation of connected things. We believe that it will have a huge impact on all economies, uh, that it will create new values, uh, give users uh, new experiences, and uh, fundamentally better products. So specifically, we will uh, go into such topic as monetization uh, of uh, Internet of Things, and how actually devices can be selling their services and their data through blockchain. So what is the Internet of Things? Imagine that there is uh, a variety of uh, things uh, out there in the world and they, all of them have digital representation online and that they are accessible and they have IP addresses. And uh, this uh, infrastructure of uh, interconnected uh, physical objects, uh, uh, people, virtual uh, objects um, uh, gives uh, possibility to process information and uh, interact and direct back to it. The term Internet of Things actually is, has, doesn't have a long history. It was coined in 1999, first time. Like we should have heard about it earlier, but uh, looking back, uh, only in year 2011, uh, we have uh, got uh, such products as Fitbit, if you know this fitness application, and Nike Fuel. It's another fitness thing, uh, measuring device, measuring sensor. And uh, Zigbee and z uh, these things stand for connected homes. Um, So, uh, and uh, let's go to forecasts. So, like mach machine research uh, say that uh, soon by year 2012 we'll have uh, something about 20 billion, 12 billion of devices. Cisco say that today we use just 0.6% uh, of all devices connected uh, between each other. And, uh, uh, Ericsson is uh, estimating that we'll be having 50 billion devices one day online, but uh, there is well other forecast saying that we'll have about 100 billions. Uh, I don't know the number, how, how big it will be, but I'm sure that uh, Internet of Things will be accelerating. And there are a few facts that I'll bring out which will help accelerating that, uh, that area. So early, sorry. So why should it accelerate? Cheap companies are producing lower cost, more efficient, smaller chips uh, with higher efficiency. Uh, the uh, uh, networking process we are witnessing now, uh, we have NFC, we have Bluetooth, uh, better, more reliable Wi-Fi connection and the mesh network, which I'm personally very excited about. Uh, there will be a rollout of IPv6, uh, which will provide us with 340 billion IP addresses comparing to IPv4, which is having gone roughly supports 40 billion addresses. Like 340 billion will surely provide enough of IP addresses for 50 billion Internet of Things devices. Uh, we have now um, bigger uh, and more powerful data tools and the barriers for entering Internet of Things uh, industry is uh, quite small. Like uh, Arduino and Raspberry Pis, these are not uh, expensive things. They are quite, uh, quite a big number of open source solutions for it. And there are always analogs to the original devices like Arduino and uh, devices that you can start experimenting with. 
So, and now I'm giving the microphone to Marsh. Thank you. So, as uh, Maria already mentioned, uh, we are expecting a high rise in numbers of IoT devices. This, uh, why is this, uh, will this happen? Because right now we do have IoT devices, but they're only like laptops, uh, smartphones, smart cars, you know, like, but in the future, the range you know, of the definition of an IoT will broaden. You know, it could be anything from a washing machine, your home and your clothes, you know. The possibilities are almost endless. But what actually are those IoTs? Um, you can say that it's like a combination of three things. It's like the sensors, uh, which provide data. And it doesn't matter what kind of data it is. It can be electric uh, current or it can be the flow of water. Magnetic, temperature, whatever is measurable. You know, you can just uh, record it and then put it onto the network through connectivity, through communication. Um, you can use any means like Wi-Fi, Ethernet, Bluetooth, NFC. You can also use uh, printed information like QR codes. And once we have this information on the network, we can use it to fuel the processes we want to do with it. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's like remote monitoring of the crew of a fleet, uh, whether if it's like customer feedback, uh, analytical data, security, or control automation. I mean, the possibilities are also quite huge. Give it back to you. Already? Okay, now uh, let's go to the topic why we should pick uh, blockchain uh, to use together with the IoT devices versus the centralized system. Uh, I'll first uh, point uh, to advantages, uh, not the technical ones like uh, no single point of failure and uh, uh, that it's uh, like trustless network, uh, but uh, advantages that it should be particularly important for our retailers. Like, and for our retailers, uh, important is the price of the transaction, uh, and for our customers, the accessibility. Accessibility uh, in the sense that uh, if you need uh, a credit card, you have to provide bank a lot of uh, documents, your citizenship, for example, your physical address where you're living. Uh, for using uh, Bitcoin wallets, all you need is to have the application running on your mobile device. And this is it. And the difference in, pri in price is, uh, well, the, the number is illustrated very well. Uh, for one debit or credit card transaction, uh, currently in Europe, uh, we're being charged for 0.2% up to 1.8%. Like these numbers range from country to country. Like in Poland and German, like rates are higher. It's uh, 1.6 up to 1.8. And if, for example, you are transacting 500 euros, you are paying 9 euros for transaction. Uh, today, with the solutions available uh, in blockchain network, we are able to process uh, data value at the price uh, 100 times smaller, it's uh, about 30 cents per 100 transactions. Like, and calculation was done, um, I used the exchange rate uh, from last week when Bitcoin dropped to uh, the price of 170 euros. Actually, for us, it's not very important uh, how well uh, the Bitcoin network will be, uh, how profitable it will be. For us, uh, interesting is the consensus uh, and the, the idea of it. Uh, we stick to solution of uh, Bitcoin network uh, only because it provides a lot of open source solutions and has good uh, testnet and it has a big community. But uh, you can use any other blockchain, other block pages. So 
uh, I would like to go exp into explaining what is blockchain, what is BTC transaction. I have witnessed a uh, lot of uh, other uh, speakers and read white papers where people are trying to explain it from perspective of view of comparing to bank and banking transaction, drawing a par parallel of Bitcoin transaction versus bank transfer. But you should abstract from that vision to be able to understand uh, this nature and to be able to successfully de develop and use it. Like, uh, I think uh, this knowledge can give you uh, inspiration how this uh, block ledger and Bitcoin transaction can be used. So I'll start with the explanation what a Bitcoin token is. You can compare it to a bank node, but the difference is uh, one is virtual, another is physical, and Bitcoin token exists only in one current state, in the state that it has uh, this set of characteristics. It's unspent, it has a certain amount, amount of BTC, uh, it has reference to its ancestor, and it has owner. Uh, and uh, this reference uh, to the ancestor, and uh, the ancestor has uh, innate uh, reference to its parent, give you the uh, picture of the whole story, how this uh, token was changed over time, its whole path, and it's all written on blockchain. With physical money, you cannot tell uh, whom the money came from. Uh, we cannot tell uh, this uh, either uh, from using uh, a Bitcoin transaction because we don't know who is the owner of the BTC address but we know for sure where it came from. So in that sense BTC token tells you much more than physical money are able to. So how we can spend this token that has owner, uh, amount of BTC uh, and reference. To spend it we need to change it. Once we change it, uh, it becomes for us dead. It cannot be spent twice. This is what actually um, all users of Bitcoin are doing. They're carrying task of verifying that uh, each uh, token is written in the blockchain on just once. So let's go to example. The simplest example where we have just one input token and two output tokens. Why so? Uh, in this example, Benjamin has a token which uh, has a value of 10 BTC and he wants to send someone, another person, 7 BTC and uh, how we can split. Uh, we cannot do it like in ordinary bank, bank transaction, like uh, get a fraction of it and uh, leave one part uh, at that account. We are going to bury this token, spend it, Changes status to spend for us is dead in the blockchain forever, and uh, it has two children. For which one, uh, which uh, from which uh, one will belong to Carl, and another will be belonging to Benjamin. It will be the change transaction of three BTC and seven BTC. The amount we wish to send will belong to Carl. So there will be two outputs, two new tokens uh, with different attributes. And what I didn't mention here is, of course, they have a time, time stamp. Like the time they did first time appear on the blockchain. Like transaction uh, may have uh, few inputs and much more outputs. I'm skipping here uh, like this part that each transaction contains as well a minor fee. Like it will be a third output. But uh, besides uh, this ordinary uh, Bitcoin transaction, which some of you may know that the confirmation of blockchain takes about 30 minutes. It's quite time consuming. Uh, there is a solution for it, it's microtransaction. The microtransaction is performed of a micropayment channel, uh, which has a certain time of duration, which you can customize, of course. And uh, when we'll go further to you, showing you use cases, uh, I will go into deeper, like lower level details, how this functions. But what it allows you to do, it allows you to perform during duration of one channel, a lot of microtransactions, like equal to, for example, one Satoshi. Like uh, for those who don't know, like uh, 
Satoshi is one fraction of Bitcoin, like one Bitcoin contains of uh, 100 million of Satoshis, like one euro of contains of 100 cents. So now we move further. Okay, so uh, now we know something about the blockchain, something about the IOTs, but uh, how can we use them together? Uh, maybe now you think that blockchain is all about transactions, but transactions are not just about payments. You can do data transactions, like every time you tweet or you put a status on your Facebook, so it's actually a data transaction. So we can perceive the blockchain as some big, let's say, database that's distributed all over the world in many nodes. So that's why uh, it's better than uh, like some centralized systems because you don't have those uh, single point of failure problems. So if one node goes down, nothing happens because the system still works, right? Uh, okay, so how can we use it? For example, if you have a Kindle, let's say, and you want to pay for a view for an article in some New York Times, for, for example. Uh, right now, you would have to pay like one cent, I don't know. But with microtransactions that uh, Maria mentioned, you can pay a fraction of a cent, you know. So this would make all these uh, things really easier. And you can pay for a lot of things, for data, for views, for services. And uh, what's even good is like uh, you can track and manage, for example, the de device life cycles. You know, we can store a lot of data on the blockchain about the devices. Like, uh, for example, for example, we have uh, a dishwasher, and. Uh, comes from the manufacturer, it gets registered on the blockchain, and we can register the information about its warranty, let's say. And let's say that uh, dishwasher breaks, you know, and you can automatically order a spare part or the repairman to come. So all the, manuf all that the manufacturer has to do is check the warranty from the blockchain and send the repair or, or the spare part. So you can do everything automatically. And this is like a real life example, you know, because we had our. Okay. And the first one is for doggy. How you can change automatically dog or cat? Or spare parts? Or no, no, no. <laughs> well, yeah, it can break. But. Uh, can break the dog? <laughs> yeah, it can. No, I mean, you can use it like, let's say you can put a GPS sensor on it. And once your dog or a cat or whatever, you know, gets lost, you can track him real easily. Or you can put some information about the owner of the dog, well, of the dog collar. So if you buy someone, it gets automatic fee for this? For example. <laughs> yeah, you see how endless these possibilities are. So, uh, or let's say you have a home entertainment system, and you're watching some TV series, and once a new episodes, episode gets out, you know, it can automatically download it and pay for it because it has its own wallet and everything is always ready for you. So these were some examples, and Maria will give you a more detailed one. Yes, I'll give you kind of a use case. The use case uh, which came out from the solutions we're working on uh, with the tools we are working on, but w what else could we do with the things we have uh, on the table right now? So let's imagine that there is a uh, train which represents uh, a mesh network. Like uh, the train itself is the head of the, which is uh, the lead uh, for other wagons that, which are following the train, <laughs> and this train has uh, one solution. The IP address, it has connection to internet, it has a small server on, uh, which uh, has running uh, Bitcoin wallet application, 
and it has solution to support the mesh network for which it is connected to other wagons which are following him and uh, Bluetooth is a pos possible alternative to the mesh that's why I brought it here so the train is having its IP address and it's uh, passing data to its wagons and uh, it collects data from the wagons and wagons may through its sensors uh, collect all kind of data like how many passengers I have on board, uh, how many places I have sold uh, but uh, humidity, temperature uh, any, any other information which sensors are able to pass but in our example we'll uh, play through use case when there's a passenger who wants uh, to buy the ticket and he has a mobile application and he's using uh, one of uh, Bitcoin wallet applications. So our passenger uh, sees the services, list of services that uh, train is offering. And uh, for example, train car 1 offers 28 free places and train car 2 offers 15 places. And uh, our car passenger decides to take uh, place 15B in card 2 and um, pay for it with Bitcoin to book the place, to purchase the ticket and uh, finally he receives a ticket, uh, uh, let it be a QR code like as we are getting used to it, like we were buying Sigma tickets it looks like this, we are having boarding passes it looks like this as well so what solutions will use? We'll use the transaction of a payment of a micropayment channel. Uh, we'll establish micropayment channel between the passenger and the train who acts as merchant uh, and server in our case. We'll lock sufficient amount to perform this purchase in customer's wallet. We'll lock like some BTC token which is sufficient for our purposes. And uh, we'll sell uh, the ticket to the person, pass the ticket, uh, and then close the channel and broadcast the transaction. So, what happens inside this channel, and why this uh, why this solution would work uh, better than ordinary Bitcoin transaction? Because uh, we are broadcasting transaction in the end of the whole purchase process when the customer already has a ticket so it uh, doesn't take uh, customers time uh, uh, to confirm the transaction like the ordinary transaction I remind takes about 30 minutes to be confirmed on the blockchain and uh, in micro channel we get confirmation uh, instantly so uh, the passenger connects to the wagon I skip here like connect that connection has uh, will go actually through the train because wagon itself doesn't have a uh, Wi-Fi connection. It may have, of course. We can put a small server for each wagon. But it uh, won't be like acting like a mesh network. So the TCP channel is up. In our example, we use this uh, connection. It may have alternatives. So the passenger wants to book a place and he sends uh, a small transaction or as one satoshi so uh, we take this locked uh, BTC token we change it into two, two tokens which uh, one is one satoshi and the other one is uh, the change that will be returned back to the passenger on one token we put on some message uh, like uh, wagon 2 please book place 15b and uh, on the change token, we put another message like your, confirm your booking is confirmed, would you like to pay now or later? And our passenger may uh, reply, for example, I want to book another place for my friend and send another Satoshi and get his change back, like your place is booked. Then, no, I would like to cancel this place and I want to book a place uh, near the window and pass like two messages more. And there can be hundreds of these mes messages passing uh, during duration of this microchannel. 
So, but our flow will uh, eventually finish with the purchase of the tickets when the customer decides to pay for it and he transacts uh, the price of the tickets, like in Bitcoin, to the wagon and he receives some change. And there is a uh, specific amount of change uh, to send this final message back to the user and pass image of uh, the ticket, this QR code. When, when this happens, we can close the channel and broadcast this transaction. But uh, what will this uh, transaction con contain? Uh, the input, this uh, token that we initially locked in uh, our customer's wallet, and output for one new token for trade, and it will be sum of all uh, one Satoshi transactions, which like uh, book this, cancel this, uh, then cancel, uh, confirm these messages, and uh, plus the price of the ticket. It will be just one sum, just one token, not uh, all this information which like happens in between. Uh, then it will be token that uh, has returned the ticket uh, to the passenger. And uh, there will be token that will be the minor fee. It will be just one minor fee, charged just for a single transaction. That's why it's cheaper. And uh, as I mentioned, like today we have all, all these things, all these solutions, uh, they are working. We can implement this scenario, but just missing one part. Uh, and it is the train. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, if you'd like to ask some questions, you're going to be picking who. who. I can pick, huh? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Pia, you were first. Well, it's quite simple. You want to lock a token, but that isn't supported by any blockchain unless you have, have some global conscious. And for that, you need to have some time to, for confirmation again. So you don't solve any issue where you want to have a transaction fast or security. Actually, we are already able to lock a token uh, when using specific application. Uh, what we didn't mention uh, yet, but it's uh, of course, it's needed to do it like before you lock it, you check on blockchain that it's unspent status. But while initiating uh, the microtransaction, you can do it, you can lock it. When you check the, if the token is unspent, yes. it's quite a tricky situation because it might be spent already, but the global conscious consensus is not yet agreeing with that transaction because it takes mm -hmm. time until it's propagated to all the blockchains. So there are these time limit tracks, I think. Uh, yes, you are right that maybe in 30 minutes time, like there can happen such thing. But I'm, I'm reserving a book like locking this. But if customer is having running two applications or different devices, I'm not able to lock it in, in each application. That's right. But uh, still, uh, what's uh, <coughs> What we consider sh m might be used uh, that we are transacting data uh, tokens uh, using uh, Bitcoin infrastructure as a, as a layer. It doesn't have uh, to be like absolutely uh, accept, accept payments only in Bitcoins. Besides, we know how like price is changing. I can answer that. Actually, it's, it behaves the same like a credit card, which you can go into minus because some transaction happened later. So it's totally the same case here. So, so you can go into minus, but then you should pay it back in your in your know. It's actually not really. If you have one Bitcoin token, it's impossible to spend it twice. You can spend it twice and it might be impossible that two entities see it as spent for themselves, but eventually there is one agreed transaction which will win. So you can't really go into minus with Bitcoin. You might try. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but if you are using uh, some third uh, application to confirm it, like uh, as I mentioned, like we are uh, putting something on top on top of Bitcoin transaction. So the thing that we are transacting uh, using Bitcoin as a layer can be verified by some third daemon. 
But it's still it's uh, it's quicker. It will be cheaper. Like uh, last year, only European retailers uh, paid uh, 300 billions just uh, for processing transactions, and 70 percent of it was for pure processing fees, and the other 30 is just for maintaining. Like, if you like. Uh, Erase few zeros out of these numbers. Is it attractive for merchants? I think it does. It is, yeah. Actually, that's what Russia said when they started to build their own processing system. <laughs> so let's see how they will do. <laughs> yes, us. Yeah. Yeah, you. Yeah, you can, please. Okay. Uh, I would like to remind something is that Bitcoin is based on the MIT license, which means that it's free to be cloned. So really, why bother with Bitcoin when you can just have a clone of Bitcoin? You won't have to matter with the uh, with the limitation of the price of Bitcoin. You won't have to matter to cater with the stupid one megabyte block size, which considerably limit the amount of transaction. And this is exactly what IBM and Samsung just announced at the CES. Mm -hmm. that we won't use Bitcoin. You won't want to bother with all these Bitcoin orders and blah blah blah. We just clone the technology. And if you clone the technology, you don't have to bother with the block size limitation. You won't have to, block, uh, to bother with the price. You won't even have to bother with the, with the transaction time. You just change mm -hmm. it. And you don't even have to bother with the limitation. You can have infinite supply. And you don't have to, to have, OK, you will always have a, a, a fee because the, the Satoshi blockchain use economic incentive. No incentive, no money, no working. Or at loss, a company can do it at loss. So um, blockchain is the power, and you're completely right, but it's not BTC blockchain, it's blockchain. Just copy. So a lot, I think a lot of issues that we're having are false issues. Clone it, and you have that. You, you fix the issues. I agree with every point. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. But there's one thing, and I don't really know about this. The one is that blockchain, one of the characteristics of 99% of the blockchain is that they are completely transparent. So everyone can see it. I'm not sure I want, for example, my wife to know that I have booked a uh, train to see my fiance in my... Well, I don't want my boss to know how much money I get. For so um, this is the problem with transparent blockchain. Now, and this I do not have the, the, the answer. If I clone Bitcoin, can I clone it in a way that the clone blockchain won't be visible? If this is possible, we're fixing a lot of problems uh, with uh, too much transparency. Yeah, oh, like Bitcoin, for example, which is some certain degree of. I'm the only one who the developer who starts and not start talking about Bitcoin. Not, not the Bitcoin. Bitcoin. There are two Bitcoins. The initial start ones just crap, bullshit, yeah. flow. Yeah. There's a second Bitcoin. It's not based it's on not Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It's not. It's not the uh, second Bitcoin. It's Monero, and I'm called developer of Monero. And then, uh, so I completely agree with you on this one. And the problem with Monero, which is very interesting because it also allows to be visible if you want to. So you can be visible for the for the IR, for the tax office, you can be visible for whoever you want, but you decide. The problem that we have now is that since it's a completely different technology, we don't have a payment processor. Uh, I'm, no, I'm working on this right now. But, uh, <laughs> But since there is really a demand for, for Internet of Things, that's for sure, I believe that uh, uh, we should stop focusing on Bitcoin and focusing more on the blockchain technology basis, and then have, for example, a clone of Monero, which would uh, allow a pri uh, an opaque blockchain and the protection of privacy if it's required. So, do you have a question or? <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a question. Uh, I'd like yes. a question uh, about physics. Uh, usually, uh, I have things of uh, low power and uh, memory constraint things. Uh -huh. But uh, Bitcoin usually requires uh, some uh, pretty powerful uh, computations, even for rectification, and has huge storage requirements. How it's uh, this uh, compatible with uh, Internet of Things? Well, you mean like on the devices, right? Yes, on the devices. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a very good question. Uh, I think it's a very good question. 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 I
on the end devices. Well, the thing is that uh, you can use some of those light wallets and stuff that can run even on... Uh, send it quite a stone to a client, client server, model where some kind of server helps end device anyway. So, Sorry, physics is uh, something we can't uh, really break. Yeah, that's that's true. So, uh, uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> how how you resolve power and memory uh, barriers issues with Bitcoin uh, transactions? Well, yeah, that's true that we have barriers like this that we will have to solve in the future because they are not solved today, but it's, we're talking about the future so that I can answer you in a better way. The electron sorted. Electron. You just, you just have a remote blockchain and no problem. You, you don't have to have 9 gigabytes in your smartphone. You just oh yeah, of course. Yeah, you can connect to it remotely. That's true. That's true. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, then uh, I guess we are done a little bit earlier, but we still have uh, time here uh, to network, to talk, and maybe you have like, some uh, like more private questions to the presenters, so you can do that as well. And 